Another month is in the books, which means it is time for me to talk about some games. So yeah, here is what I played this November. I started off with Cocoon, a puzzle game I've been looking forward to for a long while as its director Yeb Carlson was the lead gameplay designer for both Limbo and Inside, which are two of my favorite puzzle platformers. Pretty much ever since Cocoon's announcement trailer, I've been eagerly awaiting its release, and to no surprise of my own, it's brilliant. The game centers around these orbs, each of which has an unlockable ability that is used to solve the various puzzles you're faced with. Where things get really cool though, is that each of these orbs also contains a world of its own. So the gameplay loop consists of jumping in and out of these orbs to solve puzzles that then unlock their core abilities, and then you use those abilities to reach new areas and find more orbs. This setup leads to some wildly impressive and mind-bending puzzles that feel super satisfying to figure out. They are the sort of puzzles that sound confusing when you try to explain how they work, but the game does such a good job of teaching the player its core concepts that it rarely feels confusing in the moment. I've talked a lot about the puzzle game sweet spot, of it being hard enough to get the wheels turning, but not so hard that you're staring at the screen for an hour feeling like an idiot, wondering how you managed to make it this far in life if you can't solve a stupid puzzle in a video game, and Cocoon very much lands within that sweet spot. For those who are really good at these types of games, it might be a bit on the easy side, but for the majority of people, people, I think it'll be the right level of challenge. Now I will say the game does have a bit of an orb management problem. A lot of time is spent just moving them around to get them in the right configuration, and while I don't want to make this out to be the biggest deal in the world, it can feel a bit unwieldy. Also, sometimes you'll solve a puzzle pretty quickly in your head, and then have to spend a minute or so getting everything placed properly before being able to complete it. And I found that this sometimes dampened the excitement that came from solving a puzzle, as I had already done the fun part of figuring it out, and then was just left with the somewhat dull task of actually doing it. Again, I don't want to harp on this too much, and I don't even know that there is a good solution for this type of thing. It's sort of just a consequence of the game going with the concept it went with, which in my opinion is well worth this slight disconnect. Also, it's perfectly fine for a game to have downtime. Not every moment needs to be optimized, but it did stick out to me enough here to want to mention it. I would be curious to hear what you all think about this aspect of solving puzzles, as I very much could just be doing a classic Rasputin overthink. Ultimately, it's an incredible game that maybe didn't hit as hard for me as other projects Yeb has worked on, but I imagine for a lot of people it will. It's easily in my top 10 games that came out this year, so you probably should play it. After that, I got back into Sea of Stars, which I started in September, but put on the back burner so I could play other games for footage purposes. And overall, I really enjoyed it. When I last talked about it, I primarily focused on the combat, and for good reason, as it's a really cool system that calls for a lot of interesting decision making and problem solving. Being able to stun enemies enemies by hitting them with certain types of moves in a set amount of time requires you to understand the full scope of your party's moveset in a way a lot of turn-based RPGs don't. One of the best decisions they made related to this is that once you get more than three characters in your party, you can still swap between them during combat without having to use up a turn. This not only gives you more options, but it makes it so no character ever gets fully sidelined, which is something I've run into with most RPGs I've played. Like you don't know what I'd give to have every character travel with me in Baldur's Gate 3. I'm always bummed when I feel like a character doesn't make sense to use anymore, and Sea of Stars approach pretty much solves that completely, because you'll need to swap characters regularly to be effective in combat. The battle system just works so well, and is easily the part of the game I enjoyed the most. With that said, I did feel like the combat started to wear a bit thin by the end, and honestly I think the game in general wears a bit thin by the end. The last third of it drags some both narratively and gameplay wise, and in general it feels a little less polished. While I did end up liking the game enough to do a bunch of post-game stuff in order to get the true ending, I do still wish it had been a bit shorter. It being as long as it is kind of exposes a handful of issues with the story and especially the characters, who for the most part are pretty surface level. I think part of the problem comes from it being a piece of the greater story that Sabotage Studio is building out with their various games, so there ends up being some pretty important stuff that gets introduced in this story that doesn't really get resolved as it seemingly will be explored in a future game they make. While I do think this is cool in a lot of ways, it does lead to a few plot points falling flat, and until a payoff happens in a future game, I 
can't help but feel a bit disappointed by it. Additionally, I also found the exploration to be a little underwhelming. The environments are beautiful, and to get through them, you do have to engage with various obstacles, which is more interesting than just running in a straight line, but mostly is just pressing a single input to climb, jump, or sidle. I wish there would have been more things to meaningfully engage with. Like, had they had more puzzles, especially within the various dungeons, I think it would have gone a long way. Most of the ones the game does have can be solved by just looking at them for a second, so it is hard to really call them puzzles. And honestly, I don't even think they were meant to be challenging. They just seem like something that's there to keep the player somewhat engaged between fights. And it is largely successful in that, but as someone who enjoys a good dungeon puzzle, it would have been cool to have them incorporate them. Honestly, the majority of the true puzzles in the game are optional, and a handful of them are really enjoyable, so the team clearly has the skill to make good ones. And yeah, that makes me wish they had made it a core part of the game. All in all, I do think Sea of Stars is a great title that fans of JRPGs, and especially fans of Chrono Trigger, will find a lot of enjoyment in. Despite my complaints here, once I really started to get into it, I could not put it down, even when I felt like it was dragging. There is something special to this game that makes it feel really good to play, and while it did overstay its welcome for me and made some storytelling choices that I didn't love, it's well worth checking out if you like the genre. Once I rolled credits on Sea of Stars, I played Thymesia, a serviceable Souls-like that takes a lot of cues from Sekiro's combat system, but twists it up enough to feel unique. For those of you who haven't played it, which I imagine is a lot of you, you have two kinds of attacks. Your sword attack that primarily does damage to the enemy's white health bar, which is essentially like an overshield, and your claw attack, which primarily does damage to their green health bar, which is their true health. You can only do damage to the green bar if it is not covered by the white one, and if enough time passes without you landing an attack, the enemy's white bar will replenish to however much green health they have left. This leads to an aggressive playstyle where you cycle between chipping away at their white health bar with the sword, and then using the claws to make sure the damage stays. Along with using the sword, the other best way to lower the enemy's white bar is by deflecting their attacks, which, as always, feels really good when you're actually able to do it. Altogether, it is a challenging system that takes a bit to get used to as it calls for a fair bit of precision and skill, but once you figure things out, it feels really satisfying, especially when fighting the bosses, who for the most part are all pretty solid. All that is what I consider to be the core part of the combat, but there also is a sort of magic system where you can set what's called a plague weapon that spends energy to use a special attack. This adds a bunch of options to your arsenal, many of which are pretty cool. With that said, the game is somewhat short, so by the time you get access to most of them, you'll be done playing, which I don't know, isn't necessarily bad, but it does end up feeling like an overly in-depth system for a game of this scope. And when I look at it compared to other aspects of the game that are a bit underdeveloped, like its level design, it makes me wish they would have polished that stuff to the same level as the combat. Ultimately, I'd say that if you're looking for something to play that scratches the same itch as Sekiro, and you've already beaten Lies of P, you'll find a lot to enjoy with Thymesia, regardless of some of its shortcomings. To end off the month, I played Ghost Trick Phantom Detective, which was chosen for me by my patrons, and I thought it was pretty neat. A handful of people I know have talked it up for a while, so I had somewhat high expectations, and while I wouldn't say it met them completely, it wasn't that far off. In it, you play as a ghost with amnesia who is trying to figure out how and why he died. After becoming a ghost, he gained a variety of special powers, like being able to move between and manipulate various objects. He also is able to communicate with other recently dead people and attempt to save them by traveling back in time to four minutes before their death, as that's the rules, I guess. So the gameplay mostly revolves around figuring out how to change the past in a meaningful enough way in order to avert the fate of the various characters who died. A lot of these puzzles are pretty straightforward, but there are a few that take a decent amount of thought and experimentation to figure out, which is when I found the game to be at its best. The tension that comes from having a limited amount of time to solve the problem adds a level of excitement that many puzzle games don't have, and it feels amazing when you figure out what to do just before time runs out. Of course, the trade-off here is that if you don't figure it out time, you'll have to start over, which leads to some repetition. In fairness, the amount of time it takes to do each puzzle isn't that long, so when you fail, it never feels like a ton of progress is lost, and there also are checkpoints on some of the longer ones. But there were times where I ran into the same issue as the one I mentioned with Cocoon. I would figure out what I needed to do, and then had to wait around to be able to do it. It did bother me less with Ghost Trick, though, mostly because the puzzles typically call for timing something just right or executing a series of moves quickly enough, and that's a lot more 
engaging than moving balls around. Again, it's sort of an unavoidable consequence of this kind of setup for a game. So like with Cocoon, I don't know that there's a good solution. Now, while I liked the gameplay, the real star of the show here is the story, which is filled with neat twists and turns, intriguing and over the top characters, and countless little mysteries that always had me guessing at what the hell was going on. It's a fun murder mystery that simultaneously doesn't take itself too seriously, but also manages to explore deeper questions. It's a very good time. Anyway, that's all I've got. I'll see you next month unless I decide to stop doing this. Bye.